So the first half of the 20th century, the period of time we call modernism, saw extraordinary connection and collaboration between writers and artists who were working both in the traditional arts of painting and sculpture and in newer media like cinema and photography. Painters hung out with writers, and here's Gertrude Stein with her very famous portrait by Picasso, um, and the two of them relaxing at Stein's house in the French countryside. There were painters and writers who were related to each other, like the novelist Virginia Woolf and her sister, the painter Vanessa Bell, who designed covers for her books. Poets visited sculptors' studios, and people who would eventually become novelists made experimental films. Here's the novelist Evelyn Waugh at the age of 52, more or less as we remember him. Um, and then also on the left in his youth, when he and a bunch of friends made a movie about an attempt to convert the head of the Catholic the Church of England to Catholicism. So my work is about how the way in which all of this mixing, how all of these other arts influence literature. I'm interested in where the impact of this exchange between artistic media, what we call intermedial exchange, shows up and what it looks like. And my forthcoming book argues that the arts help to shape the form of literary texts. What do I mean by form? It's a word that, as you can see, has a lot of definitions. Form comes from the Latin forma, meaning shape. Shape, a mold, something that holds or shapes, a species or kind, a pattern or type, a way of being. I'll stop there. It's going to stay up there for a while for you to look at. Scholars agree that these very many definitions of form yield two common strands, two root meanings for form. Form first refers to the essence of something. That is, in the words of a scholar named Nicholas Gaskell, form is the immaterial nature that makes a thing what it is. Second, form refers to the shape of something, uh, its material aspects. And in literary studies, we have most often focused on this second definition of form, shape. Usually, what we mean by form, and here's one example from my introduction to poetry class from the last couple of weeks, is the set of rules that govern the setup of a literary work. Here's an English sonnet. It's Shakespeare's Sonnet 73. And this is what makes it a sonnet. It has 14 lines, and those 14 lines follow a particular rhyme scheme. The rhyme scheme divides the poem into three quatrains, three four-line stanzas, and a concluding couplet. And Shakespeare punctuates the poem to draw attention to that structure with periods at the end of each of those units. It's also written in iambic pentameter, which is the usual meter or rhythmic pattern for the English sonnet. That's the form of a sonnet. But you'll notice that in order to delineate that form, I haven't really needed to read the poem. I've just told you about it. And that's because Typically, when literary critics have talked about form, we have stopped there with the set of rules, which is partly why students often find thinking about form really boring. We treat form as though it's a container into which content gets poured, and then all the form does is hold the content together. But forms also lend themselves to particular kinds of content better than others, and that's true of this sonnet, which happens to think the way a sonnet thinks. It considers a topic from three different angles. Here, the topic is the speaker's advanced age, which is in turn like autumn, like twilight, and like the final embers of a fire. And then it caps off that three-part consideration with a nice, tidy conclusion that rounds off the whole poem. So form isn't just a set of rules or restrictions. Form is also an enabling force that helps the poem to do its work. And my work is about explaining the kinds of things that form does in the early 20th century in the period we call modernism. I've been motivated by a scholarly consensus that has never seemed quite right to me, which is that scholars have, for decades, explained how form in modernism gets more whole, more complete, more self-sufficient and autonomous, and seemingly separate from the world, like Brancusi's birds here. That is, scholars have conflated modernism with a kind of isolationist formalism. But the widespread, radical formal experimentation that writers undertake in response to their encounters with sculpture and painting and photography and film, encounters like the ones I began with, show us that modernism is obsessed with form, and modernism may even be at times a formalism itself, but that form is far more dynamic than we have given it credit for. So take, for instance, the poet Mina Loy, who I showed you earlier. She wrote no small number of poems about her contemporaries and their work, including the sculptor Constantine Brancusi. And one notable sculpture is about Brancusi's golden bird sculpture, the middle of the three I showed you earlier. 
In a poem called Brancusi's Golden Bird, Loy calls this particular sculpture the aesthetic archetype, the absolute act of art conformed to continent sculpture. Seen from the vantage point of previous scholars, Loy's project, like Brancusi's, strives to isolate the image so that it reaches an apotheosis in the kind of self-contained formal purity of the artwork. But Loy's purported formal purity, like Brancusi's, is not what it seems. In another piece from the late 1920s or early 1930s, we're uncertain of the date, that's called Brancusi and the Ocean, that's also a formal hybrid itself. It's sort of a critical essay and sort of a prose poem. Loy writes that in Brancusi's work, she has found the form on which form is based, an art engendered beyond the formidable naked subjectivity. Here is no abstraction coerced to the domain of form, perhaps form arrested at its very inception, a certain elan of primary embodiment. According to Loy, Brancusi hadn't, hasn't seized the notion of abstraction and encapsulated it in a physical form. Instead, what he has done is captured form itself as it begins to exist in an initial elemental state. What Loy wants us to understand about Brancusi here is that his work is less about presenting formed wholes, less about works of art as explicit and finished forms, and more about art as what Raymond Williams has called a formative process. And Loy's emphasis on formative process becomes even more apparent if we scrutinize her diction here. An art engendered beyond subjectivity, form arrested at its inception, an elan of primary embodiment. This is the very same diction that Loy uses in other poems, her more autobiographical poetry, to theorize human conception and childbirth. And I could say more, about the political ramifications of understanding conception of people and art in the way that she does, since part of what she's doing is countering ideas put forward by some male avant-garde artists in the period um, about their ideal of immaculate male conception as a sort of new creative goal. But what's important for our purposes is that if Loy sees Brancusi's sculpture as accomplishing a kind of conception, if the golden bird renders form as it becomes material and enters the physical world, then what his wor work offers the viewer is something that we might call protoform, the form on which form is based. This is a theory of form that shows us how form can work in the opposite direction from what we might expect. Form isn't the end product, the set of rules, but rather the initial fundamental moment. Form doesn't concentrate turning inwards, but gestures outward. Here is no abstraction coerced to the domain of form, but form arrested at its very inception. So put differently, Brancusi's sculpture doesn't contain by gathering up all the forms in the world. Form contains here, if it contains at all, by letting us see the moment right before the Pandora's box of potential forms is opened. But yet another way, form is protean, not platonic. And that is just one of the qualities that form has. Form fulfills such various functions that we cannot characterize it as a mere container for content or matter, nor can we consign it to ignominy, opposite historicism, or political commitment. As one of my favorite novelists, Ali Smith, puts it, in its apparent fixity, form is all about change. And that is never more true than it is in modernist literature as it is impacted by other arts and media. And as I show with many other examples throughout the book, form is mobile and malleable, capable of movement and metamorphosis. Forms that we might believe to be stable shift depending on our viewpoint and our viewing moment. Form carries the charge of narrative propulsion. Form happens to erupt into activity. And as we've just seen with Mina Loy, sculpted shape incarnates multiform possibilities yet to come. In modernism, form drives and shifts. It rounds, it mourns, it radiates, it misbehaves, it connects. It's a structure or a scheme that enables action. And by elaborating the dynamics of the many forms of modernist intermediality, my more capacious account of what form looks like will, I hope, shift our understanding of what form can and does do. Thank you. <laughs>